Hi, in this second portion of the visual pathway lecture, we will discuss different visual pathway pathologies that you can come across in the clinical setting. So if you remember, in the first part of the lecture, we, talk, we started off by talking about the components of the visual pathway system. We talked about the visual field, the lens, the retina, the optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, the optic radiations, and the visual cortex itself. Now we will discuss what happens in lesions at each individual step of the pathway. We will briefly review some important points throughout this lecture, but for further review, refer to the first video of this series. So to begin, we will quickly review the information from the superior peripheral portion of the visual field travels through the lens to the inferior medial portion, also known as the inferior portion of the nasal hemiretina. Information from the superior medial portion of the visual field will travel through the lens to the inferior lateral portion of the retina, also known as the inferior portion of the temporal hemiretina and vice versa applies for the inferior portions of the visual field. The first portion of pathology that we will discuss is cataracts, commonly found in the lenses of patients who are diabetic or potentially on chronic glucocorticoids, which raises blood glucose levels. In cataracts, patients have blurring of the visual field and clouding of the lenses. It's not the typical lesion that we discuss. However, in the USMLE question, they might refer to it as a whitening or clouding of their visual fields. They will give you the risk factors, and that'll be the easiest decision you make on the test. So now we'll move back a little bit to the retina. So again, we briefly touched on the information at the temporal hemiretina comes from the central portion of vision, and information from the nasal hemiretina comes from peripheral vision. So that in the case of, let's say, we had a retinal hemorrhage to the left-sided superior temporal hemiretina, we would have an inferior medial visual field defect. Now you might not be able to tell right away in a patient, in a clinical setting, that they have this defect. How you would tell would be that you would have them close each eye individually and test their visual fields by having them look at you looking straight forward. I say this only because in the medial portions of central vision, we do have overlap between information passed from the left and right eyes. So you will need to isolate these visual field defects. So now we've discussed from the lens to the retina pathologies. Let's move on to the optic nerve. So information is passed from the retina to the optic nerve. We can have a full lesion of the optic nerve, potentially in cases of trauma, or a partial lesion of the optic nerve in cases of MS. Either way, if we have a full lesion of the optic nerve, we are going to lose vision in that eye. If we have a partial lesion of the optic nerve, we're going to have to determine, is it peripheral? Is it medial? Is it superior? Is it inferior? And again, the same rules from there would apply as those that went for the retina. Okay, but full lesion, lose all of vision. Partial lesion, follow the rules of the retina laid down before. Now we will discuss the optic chiasm. This is a classic example of a visual field defect. Traditionally, you'll have a patient with a pituitary adenoma. This pituitary adenoma will cause pressure down on the optic chiasm. Now, if we remember back to the visual pathway lecture, the first one, we talked about how these fibers right here at the optic chiasm crossing over 
were from the nasal hemi retina. This means that they contributed to peripheral vision. So if we press down on these nerves, we will lose peripheral vision in both the left and the right eyes. Traditional for a pituitary adenoma, again. If by some rare chance we have a lesion of the peripheral portions of the optic chiasm, we are only going to lose the medial or central visual fields from that affected side. Now we can move on to the optic tract. Traditionally, an optic tract lesion is not going to be asked. However, it may pop up in the cases of a mass, potentially caused by a tumor, potentially caused by an abscess. So let's see what would happen to an optic tract lesion. So now we have fibers from the left and right eyes contributing to each individual optic tract. So which side of vision is that? Let's review. So on the left side, we have information right here in the blue and green. If we trace this back all the way to the visual fields, we'll find out that this is the left eye and this will be the right hand portions of vision from the left eye. If we trace back to the blue turquoise and to the purple strings all the way back from this optic tract, we'll know that it is the right hand side of the right eye's visual fields, okay? So this is an important point. From here on out, these fibers will correlate to the right-hand side of vision, and these fibers over here will be from the left-hand side of vision from both eyes. So now if I lesion this optic tract, if I lesion it all, let's say in the case of a tumor or mass, I'm gonna lose all of my right hand side of vision in both my left eye and in my right eye. The lesion at the optic tract is known as contralateral homonymous hemonopsia. So now let's talk about a lesion at the lateral geniculate nucleus. Again, this could be seen in cases of the Lamic stroke, most likely. This is gonna be a similar lesion seen in the optic tract. So we're gonna have contralateral homonymous hemonopsia with a lesion to the lateral geniculate nucleus. So let's talk about our friends, the optic radiations again. So again, we've got the superior loop that travels through the parietal lobe the inferior loop that travels through the temporal loop. This loop is also known as Myers loop. So in these lesions, commonly found in stroke or possibly brain tumor, you will have additional portions of information provided in traditional test questions. In the case of stroke, they might have other defects. In the case of tumor, they may have other symptoms, okay? So if we lesion the superior optic radiations, if we trace it all the way back to the visual fields, remember, these are going to contribute on the left-hand side to the right-hand portions of visions. And because they're superior, that must mean they're from the inferior portions of the visual fields. So that if we lesion the inferior optic radiations, or Myers loop, we are going to have, on the left side, we are going to have visual field defects at the superior right-hand side of vision in the visual fields in both eyes, okay? So inferior optic radiation lesions are gonna cause superior field defects. Superior optic radiation defects are going to cause inferior visual field defects, okay? If we lesion this su left superior optic radiation, what we are going to be left with is a right homonymous inferior quadrantopsia. And if we lesion this left 
Myers loop, what we're going to be left with is a right homonymous superior quadratopsia. Say that five times fast. We're left with the visual cortex. At the visual cortex, if we have a lesion of the whole visual cortex, we're going to have a lesion similar to that of the optic tract, with one exception. And this exception is that we're going to have what is called macular sparing. And all macular sparing means to you as a student is essentially the central portion of the visual field will be spared as shown here. This is because we have some crossover between the left and right visual cortexes that does not exist at the level of the optic tract. So in the case of a full visual cortex lesion, we are going to have contralateral homonymous hemonopsia with macular sparing. So if we have a lesion of the upper bank of the calcarine fissure, we're going to have what's called a right homonymous inferior quadrantopsia with macular sparing. And if we have a lesion on this side, on the left side of the inferior bank of the calcarine fissure, we're going to have a right homonymous superior quadrantopsia with macular sparing. And that took 17 takes.